Um, the um, Sinalog writer and journalist Tilman Spengler. It's quite pleasant to be welcomed twice. Um, some housekeeping which I forgot to mention before. You probably have seen that outside you have an example of the um, benefits of German book trade. Um, there is a table with books which are sold, which I would like to invite you to use. Signed books have a higher added value than a savings account. So it's not just a literary advice, it's an investment in advice I would like to give you. I'm quite happy, or was, I was happy about the discussion we've had because it mentioned a lot of things I wanted to say now, in particular when it comes to European value and this turn. Um, Kupferberg was perfect in, in, in making the point. What, what do we mean if we say European values? Are we speaking about values um, for lamp bulbs in, in Brussels and this regulation? That would be one perspective. And the others are, of course, ethical values with moral connotations pointing to the possibility of being universal values. And we shouldn't lie to ourselves. European values are not just what we would like to have as European values we would like to have. If we think of the time more than 60 years ago among these values was blood and soil, clear borders, good German women. These are all European values and a lot of people fought for these values, and we see that they have not yet died out completely, in particular if you look at Europe and to our neighbors. The next term, which struck me, integration, which today it's used like a wafer, it, integration meant, mental refreshment, if you look at the Latin origin of the word. And I would like to see more of this original sense of the word in the public debate. And I would like to tell my, in particular, my German writing colleagues to deal with a new optical term, which I heard on television yesterday when the Minister of the Interior talked about um, the staying perspectives. You can have a favorable or unfavorable um, perspective to stay. It's, it's nothing optical. You don't need to see a doctor. It's just uh, description of whom we can throw out and whom we have to bear with. This is subsumed under this concept of staying perspective. The next topic brings together all, all this what was said. The question now is how much immigration can culture handle? One might say that this is a very shrewd question. And as a soldier Schwalk, you might also ask how much deduction can culture live with? And then historically, the answer might be very sad. But when we ask this question, Things came to our mind that we asked, for example, what can be quantified when we talk about ethical values? Can tolerance be quantified? If 
we compile a list of values. What is the relation among these values? Do they grow in this contact or the contrary? And something else, what you know from the press, if the if German industry is in favor of migrants and migration, then the image arises that we need migration because it makes Germany economically successful, is the economization of these ethical values. This will be discussed um, with very intelligent questions by Mr. Boom and the panelists, um, Lavan Motadi, who came from Sweden. She worked particularly on um, Romas in their culture and in her culture. And with this, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to her. And I'm equally happy to welcome Mehmet Heshim, originally from Cyprus, um, <coughs> specialist not just in overcoming geographical borders, but also of t Time borders. One book I appreciate most, focusing on Sappho the, and the Persian poet Romy, covering more than 2,000 years. It's a great work. Unfortunately, it's only available in French here, but it shows the deep breath which goes through Mehmet Yashin's work. And I'm equally happy that Nir Baram is here and has come from Tel Aviv. A warm welcome, whom you know from a lot of reports. I read his reports, and they reminded me of Josef Roth, not Eugen Roth, of course. No, it was Josef Roth. And when I asked him politely if he had any relation to Josef Roth's work, he said very laconically, that is an insult. No, 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 I, I, I didn't say that. Just insult stays. The rest wasn't sad, OK? <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> and in your program, you still see our friend and colleague, Lucas Berfus from Switzerland, who unfortunately had to cancel his attendance because he felt sick and we wish him all the best wherever he might be at the moment and that he will recover soon. Well, there was not just one from Switzerland. He, we had the second Swiss. He's not the second Swiss, but today he's our first Swiss, Swiss um, Jonas Lüscher. who generously agreed to stand in. You might know a novel by his with the title, Spring of Barbarians. And you can discuss with him a broad range of issues, philosophy, morals, and education. So, and that is why I'm happy to listen to him at least for 20 minutes, he might be able to, to talk even longer, 24 hours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lüscher, and a warm welcome. And I wish you all a positive staying perspective for this conference. <laughs> thank you, Tillmann Spengler. Well, same perspective. 
Well, we certainly will have to do some linguistic work in this panel, which is announced with a sentence. A widespread idea is that immigration of people from different cultures and with different native languages might have a negative effect on the existing culture of the country. I would like to ask the first question to Lavin Motadi. She comes from Sweden. And in addition to what Timan Spengler said dealing with Roma, she looked into the historical development of racism, migration, and gender policies. Sweden has per capita received most war refugees. Lavin, has the Swedish culture suffered a negative effect by people from different cultures and with different native languages or by the behavior towards these people? Well, yes, they have suffered and I am one of those who made them suffer. Uh, no, I mean, of course, this is uh, an impossible uh, question to answer in this way uh, because we cannot talk about this without talking about what's going on in the world and particularly about Syria. And before 15, I would say that the immigration issues were uh, alive and debated in Sweden, as I guess uh, everywhere else. But uh, from, uh, from the total in intensification of the, of the movements and uh, of, the, of the despair, uh, this has become one of the biggest issues in, in Sweden. And so the, the, we haven't yet seen any kind of how is this going to affect culture. I mean, this is, an, this is almost an absurd question to me. Uh, it's really more on the level of uh, what the heck is going to happen to people. And I... I, I I share uh, the, the view that this is a true crisis and that this is a time for uh, action. Um, this question, what the heck is going on, was also asked by a large Swedish newspaper. What do you think is happening with the people in Sweden, with refugees in people, uh, in Sweden, sorry? Well, I mean, you see these kinds of two uh, two main currents. One of them is, uh, of course, the um, uh, non-immigration stance. Uh, we cannot take this. And then what you've seen in also the past one, two, three years is a new popular movement uh, throughout Sweden uh, in the big cities, in the small cities, on the countryside and the... Uh, in the villages, uh, people engaging to uh, support the refugees, uh, either by collecting clothes, collecting money, going to uh, uh, the Greek islands, uh, or um, making sure that the schools are working, that there's activities for children, that people, when they arrive somewhere, there's going to be other people there to just greet them and say, okay, hello the, to your new life. So you have, of course, you have the whole anti-immigration uh, force. And that's a big challenge. But I think also it's important to speak about the other Europe. And uh, when we speak about the people and we speak about them and how afraid they are, I think it's really, really important to remember that the other ones, uh, the people who do the actions, the people who go and uh, talk to the kids, the people who uh, engage in the schools, uh, the ones who collect uh, the clothes, they are the people too. Uh, the, I mean, I'm sure this is the, the situation here that the right-wing nationalism really try to uh, uh, really try to sort of, how would you say, take hostage uh, this term, the people. And I think that this has to really be combated. One might 
say that, uh, which I expressed, that there would be a negative effect on culture might be turned around by saying that what we are seeing, um, this generosity, the readiness to help and assist, uh, created a culture which we didn't believe that it would be possible before, especially we in Germany. If somebody had told us three years ago that we would have something like a willkommens culture, a welcoming culture, we wouldn't have even understood what, what they meant. And what is the situation in Switzerland like at the moment? Well, it's difficult to answer because I'm living in Germany and I um, didn't um, undergo it in, in Switzerland as ever. And by what I hear from my friends in, and family in Switzerland, um, it seems to be similar to what we've seen in Germany. The interesting point was the point last September, October, when so many refugees arrived in Germany that nobody of them wanted to go to Switzerland. Switzerland had prepared to this great disaster, as um, Switzerland loves to do. And as always, there wasn't a disaster, so everybody was disappointed. Well, let's later come back to the other side of the anti-democratic movement of the newly arising riot um, in, in Germany. But before we do this, I would like to talk with Mehmet Yashim. He is a um, poet and novel writer from Cyprus, and he said once he learned early one lesson that he couldn't be any country's um, a poet because of the Cypriot history. And Rimbo um, one managed a query there, and we all know his famous sentence, I is another, which also points to how obsolete our idea of identity is. Mehmet Yashin, what do you do with all these terms we, which we heard? Um, refugee, migrant, um, immigrant, immigration. What do you think about these terms and are they useful to you? Yes, we talk about this subject. Uh, this is one of the things that I confuse because we talk about refugees as immigrants or sometimes we talk about settlers as if they are refugees. So these are, I think, these concepts need to be defined. This is the, on the surface, is uh, uh, because if you are a refugee, you have some rights uh, under the protection of United Nations. Uh, you are not an uh, economic immigrant. Uh, situation is different. And uh, you need help, actually, in order to survive. It's completely different things. I mean, we are not talking about uh, we have to help people who had a, such a, a terrible situation under the war or uh, uh, another conflicting reasons. So, but we treated them as if they are settlers to come our homes, our place to colonize and to impose their cultures, re religion uh, to us, you know, uh, not refugees. Official title is immigrant and how we treat them as settlers. Uh, so this is one thing which we need to be a little bit clear because it has some other aspects on international law, but other things which sub-readings, sub-readings, which is very disturbing for me, which I came from a mixed background. We have an idea that we have singular culture, homogeneous, unchanged, static, so we talk about protecting a culture. If, but we also keep talking about multilingualism, multiculturalism, multi this, multi this. And we don't have a singular identity. I have a Muslim name, but my surname intent that I may have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestor. I have some links with Greek Orthodoxy, also some links Italian Catholicism. So I am officially a uh, British citizen. I was born as British citizen in Cyprus. I'm Turkish, I write in Turkish and I consider as Turkish author and writer as well. And recently, officially, I was accepted as Greek author as well, thanks to Americans. They published my works in anthologies of recent Greek literature. So I don't have a singular identity anyway in all aspects. Neither language, nor religion, 
no citizenship or uh, nothing. I mean, who has a, we assume that everyone singular, you know, belongings, even gender uh, aspects. And when we talk about refugees, immigrants, actually we don't talk about German immigrants or refugees after the wall collapse, who they never considered as immigrant from east to west when they immigrated. So we talk about Muslims. If you have a Muslim names, it's, I mean, refugees, identical, turn to a term identical with Muslims, and nowadays, if you are European for thousands of years as a Muslim person, we have such countries like that and such communities, European but born Muslim, uh, they assume that you are immigrant. I mean, Bosnians, immigrants now, you know, because Muslims and immigrants became identical. So there are some sub uh, implications as well. So that's how I would like to talk about first, because which immigrants are we talking about or refugees? Let's first indulge into the confusion of the concepts. Nirbaram told me yesterday he wanted to start today by presenting Israel as a European country in the sense that there are similar and very different questions of migration. Well, I think that um, part of the problem of, of the Israeli state is that the people who found Israel came from Europe, uh, from Russia, from Poland, from Germany, and uh, they wanted to create a certain uh, European state in the Middle East, and uh, which is, first of all, it's, it's a strange idea, because, uh, uh, because uh, you can totally enforce a European culture on a different region. And I think that what happened that in the beginning of the, of the Israeli state, you could have seen this uh, a tendency to, toward Europe, also to, toward the, the US. And then in the 50s came the Arab migration, the Jewish Arab migration to Israel. For Morocco, my grandmother came from Syria, my grandfather came from Yemen. And um, I think that for a long time, these people felt oppressed by the Jewish European uh, culture and tradition and theater. No, when I was young, part of the literature that I read was the Soviet literature. For us, the Russian literature was Soviet literature, which is not, of course. So we read uh, Alexei Tolstoy and Sholakhov, and we thought that this is Russian literature, uh, what, what you might call the socialist realism. And, um, and in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, you can see a very interesting case of migration they totally challenge the, the, let's say, the, the culture that ruled Israel for a long time. And I think that in the last five years, you see a really battle between the immigrants, which are now total Israelis, of course, and the people who came before them. And I think that uh, when you talk about culture, you always have to remember uh, something that uh, the French philosopher uh, Gilles Deleuze wrote. He was talking about becoming. And he said that the culture or a state that it's in the becoming, which means that in, in becoming, you're still shaping your, uh, your figure, you're still changing, you're still evolving. You haven't reached your final uh, structure. And he said that, uh, that if you're in becoming, you're alive. But as soon as you, you know, that you decided that you are like this, that this is your culture, you're dead. And I think that the Israeli culture will totally benefit from this struggle because then, Part of the claim of the Israeli that came from Arab countries is that we are not European. And we should stop pretend as if Israel is a European country. And we should start thinking about Israel as a place in the Middle East, which then become, make Israel a totally different place. Because for example, there is the question of Arab speaking. I mean, 98% of the Israelis don't speak Arab. And they live in an Arabic, uh, um, geographical structure, right? And so uh, this case of migration, I think it's very interesting because it created a certain challenge, but a real challenge, a profound challenge, 
which I don't know exactly from other countries in the last 20, 25 years, of what does it mean, what does Israeli culture means. It didn't just challenge and said, we want a place in the Israeli culture. It, they say we want to uh, start to shape and to define the Israeli culture as not necessarily European culture. And I think this was very interesting. The problem of Israel in this sense is this is always a discourse between Jewish people. Israel is not really open to a challenge on its culture from non-Jewish people. This is, I think, part of the problem. Sie haben es gerade gesagt, Kultur ist werden. Ähm yes, and you did say so. Culture means it is a process in development. And we heard this morning also that this holds true for Europe as well. Europe is also in the making. And it does hold true for every individual European citizen. Tim and Spengler earlier on pointed to the topics at hand the problems that we do have in this regard. I myself, I'm a friend of a Syrian writer who told me, well, if you really want to help us, then just stop uh, calling us refugees. Now, if you take a look around and if you take a look at the terms that are not mm, considered positive terms, how many such terms we have, for example, people with a migration background, you know, that's a term in kind. Well, this is awful. And maybe in Switzerland, we know of different terms because in Switzerland, you have a term secondo, for example, that might have a different connotation, a more positive connotation, a more positive kind of concept that is being used. So maybe you have these uh, more positive concepts in Sweden, in Israel, etc. But let's talk, let's hear about the secondos in Switzerland first. A secondo is really an immigrant, second generation immigrant. So the parents have reached the country and then the children are born and they are the second generation. The parents might not have the Swiss nationality, but the children do. So the secondos themselves call themselves secondos. So this is an identity that they are coming to grips with, and they identify with that term. In Switzerland, some people do not know that uh, we are a or have become an immigration country. 24% of our population um, is based on migrants who've come into our country. I think in Germany, it's only 9% or so. I think this is important to note. The European countries, for a very long period of time, had an exodus. You know, people left these countries, and they produced what we would call an economic refugee. And this was also something we produced in Switzerland. But the secondo term is a more positively connotated term. We have to understand, however, that in Switzerland, too, we have been discussing a new law. So a law on uh, sending back people to their own country because they have committed a criminal offense. So we do have currents and movements in Switzerland that were dealing with this type of programmatic theme. They wanted to see to it that, well, okay, it would be enough, for example, to steal an apple or two when you're 18 years of age, and then that would also already mean that you could actually be returned to the other country. And now this was different or would be different with the secondo term. For months we have been discussing this issue because basically it could have happened that Switzerland would have um, become a country with two different classes of citizens, you know, the secondos and other immigrants, um, etc. 
So actually, over the past, we have seen initiatives springing up in Switzerland where uh, there was, you know, the basic outcome was always an aggravation of the existing policies. So there was a grassroots movement, actually, in this regard that happened to mobilize um, efforts from among a majority of the people. And therefore, this is uh, a law that did not happen then. So but actually, last year, then this term of secondos came to the fore, and people became more aware of it. So then the question to the other three panelists as to positively connotated terms or descriptions in your language for migrants, for refugees, what have you. Do these exist? Wenn Ihnen das ad hoc nicht einfällt, wenn wir Well, maybe you cannot really think uh, about that immediately. We can actually also then come back to that point a little bit later. And uh, so maybe we should move on to the second part of our questions, namely uh, the question of how much immigration can culture handle and of course uh, the question is what do we mean by culture i would like to make two observations in this regard uh, when preparing for this conference i read a story on europe by a german historian and um, he wrote in a book after the great political decisions had been taken for democracy and market economy the europeans after 1989 actually uh, used their freedom of choice. They consumed more, they traveled more, they used new communication media, they supported football clubs, they watched films and TVs and listened to pop music. Now, in his Manifest for London, Sadiq Khan, the upcoming mayor of London, actually also added a chapter on the arts, culture, and creativity. And uh, what is concrete in this last chapter of his manifest is that uh, he is going to improve the situation of sports. And he also wants to invite a team of NFL uh, to actually um, settle in London. So if culture then exists, uh, or it has these two parts, consumption and sports, well, do we have to be concerned? What about culture? and how much immigration can culture handle then? Actually, uh, is lineups of football and national teams only, uh, you know, the, the one thing that we have to uh, think about in terms of cultures? And you did score, Yashim, right? Definition of culture, um, I have to say in this sense that uh, we had a, a match between the Israeli writers team and the German writers team. And we won 4-2 uh, in Israel. Uh, and I think this is uh, the most significant culture event in the history of Israel and Germany, let's say after 1945. Um, uh, secondly, I, I want to say something um, which I think it's important from the Israeli perspective. I think that uh, if you look at Europe, uh, this experiment of the European Union, uh, from, the, from an Israeli perspective, you see that the European uh, took this risk or made this effort or thought about this idea of people from different backgrounds and nationality living together in certain cities. Not everywhere, of course, but in certain cities in Europe. And I think this was very fruitful, fruitful, for, the, fruitful for the European culture in many places, in Spain, in, of course in Germany, also in the UK, also in Paris. And I think that part of the reason is that you truly observe and have to look at people from, from different culture who comes into your culture and start to write and to produce culture uh, attributes. And I think it's very interesting. The Israeli case is a place when there is a, a real walls that separate the, the Israeli Jewish culture with, other, with people from different background, nationality, and religious, which means that the Israeli culture it's like, self it's like a self-consumption of the Israeli Jewish story. It's truly, in a way, a ghetto culture, a, a, a culture that's surrounded by walls and live inside this Jewish ghetto. And I think that this is part of our problem, that we are not, we don't see an Israeli, you know, a Colombian, a Christian Israeli who writes novel in Hebrew. We can hardly see it. 
We don't have this experience of even, even someone from Spain for other countries. And I think this is, this is a problem in, this, in, the, in the Israeli society and culture. And I think that if we look at Europe, there are many problems in Europe, but Europe took this risk, and it's not perfect, and it's very problematic, but took this risk in order to try to mixture people from different backgrounds. I think this is essentially missing in the Israeli culture that's been produced in Israel. You want me to continue talking, or you want to say something? <laughs> well, our, I mean, our, yeah, I have to admit, this topic is quite... Uh, it, it doesn't tell you what it wants. Why are we here? Why, why do we sit here and talk about these things? So if I may go, I mean, uh, one way or the other, we end up uh, speaking or addressing this kind of very turmoil, problematic, uh, critical time that we are in. Uh, this is the way I, I mean, this is the way I uh, see this discussion or this whole conference. And so one of the things that I would like to bring up here and that is at, not at all handled as a crisis in Europe is the Roma situation, uh, which is of course uh, Roma people, the largest European uh, minority and perhaps also the minority uh, uh, which the history of the Roma people and the persecution of the Roma people, Europe has not yet dealt with. And the result of it we see on the streets uh, with a kind of permanent state of um, poverty, permanent state of uh, discrimination and permanent state of racism. And so when we talk about immigration, I always find this interesting because we are uh, inventing new terms to address the Roma experience of uh, exclusion. For example, in Sweden we say um, EU uh, immigrants, uh, which is a complete invention, of course, because uh, it is a paradox uh, against the whole European concept. Uh, we don't have immigrants in Europe. That's why we call ourselves Europe. So I think this is uh, I think this is just an expression of how deep that crisis goes, and how sort of the the racism against Roma is, I would say, the, the sort of the the last socially acceptable accepted uh, racism, and, and and so when we speak about Europe, where do we start, where do we end? Uh, we really do have one big issue that we haven't dealt with at all, and it's not about immigrants. And it's very, very easy for us to look at the US and say they have a terrible history, uh, they have a, such a strong uh, uh, ideas on race, on racism, and we are not like them. But I, I, I don't, yeah, I think that's a very problematic uh, view. Yes. Uh, I think in previous panel, one, uh, I think, Polish participant told about uh, people has right to afraid or questioning this. First, we have to respect this. Uh, even I'm not agree with that because whole edu education system and our culture which we proud of uh, give a sense that we have unchanged uh, one single Europe. Imagine our patterns of the history books that we read more or less similar in whole European countries from ancient Greek, the Enlightenment, uh, Renaissance, this and that, a reform period of Christianity. Uh, we don't have a reference to Andalusia. Early 8th century, we had the Muslims in Western age of Europe, which is, Islam was born actually in those times. And uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 13th century, we had a Muslims in Ottoman Muslims in the uh, Balkans and Eastern Europe. So I mean, we have a different concepts. We ha we define Europe 
for generations and generations, we gave ideology to them about pure Europe, you know, white and uh, Christian and this and that. And then now uh, we criticize people that they are afraid of immigration or xenophobia, they have this and that. So this is one thing. Other thing, which another participant mentioned, we need to look things globally. I don't think that as European, we really have a global understanding, even European Union couldn't succeed to be European yet. This is the one main point. You know, I always made joke with Cyprus because they imagine that Cyprus is in the Manchester, British Channel, in between Netherlands and Britain. Uh, when we talk about Syria, they talk about as if it is far away, but uh, closest neighbor to uh, Cyprus. Because of this uh, European setup from British or even perhaps earlier period, uh, uh, Frank, uh, Italian, Venetian period, made us locate our own country in uh, Nordic uh, Europe. And uh, to ignore Israel, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, which is our closest neighbor, you know? So something is wrong about all this definition and concepts and our understanding. Other things, we keep mentioning globalization, but we don't understand that we couldn't treat the problems anymore like we did 50 years, half a century ago, as a quite far away stranger's problem in Syria, Israel, Lebanon. Nothing to do with us in Europe because it's far away. It's not. We live in a global world and every problem affects each other. We have, as European, we have to take some initiative, particularly Germany perhaps, uh, while well, must be active, the Second World War is over, S be more sensitive this uh, regional problem. I mean, from Ukraine to Georgia, you know, uh, the border lines. Uh, this is problem. And I have some objection about the definition of culture later, I will tell this. Ich würde gerne einhaken, da wo du jetzt von dieser Angst. So we heard about fear that needs to be respected, taken seriously. Well, and actually, when I took a look at this question uh, this very morning and I thought, OK, I have to say something about it. Well, it crossed my mind that in order to actually ruin our culture, we don't need any immigrants to do though. So because that's what our right wing people uh, and extremists do themselves. Well. Of course, this was a little bit of a joke, but really, let's or show me a single country where the culture is being threatened by immigrants. On the other hand, we do see the nationalists, you know, that uh, storm the theaters. We have national conservatives uh, in, you know, taking up jobs in the administration of universities, etc. I mean, this is where the threat comes from and the real risk. In many liberal panels this claim that the right wing, uh, it's only about fear, it's only about racism, it's also about not listening. Because when we talk about culture, we also talk, in my view, about economical everyday reality. It's a part of the everyday culture. And I think that many people of working class in different countries in Europe and also in the US and also in Israel see this global world that people that go from country to country to uh, exhibit books, et cetera, et cetera, as something that totally jeopardizes their everyday existence because, for example, of the salary crisis, which means that uh, you should try to listen to what working class people tell you about the way that the globalized world totally crushed their ability to live their life in a decent way because it totally crushed the salaries all around the West, for example. And, and to not listen, and, and why, why, why do I say Because part of this uh, anger or frustration goes against migration. Not necessarily racism, by the way, because for example, I can tell you that I knew people in Jerusalem, uh, working class people, 
that work hard and, and earn not a lot of money, and they saw how people came from different countries, from even Palestine or other places, and what they understood is uh, lower the salaries and took the opportunities, they felt frustrated. Now, you don't have to agree with it, but you have to listen to this kind of frustration. And the only way to talk about this is call everybody racist, fearful, uh, and not trying to also understand the life of people that are not from your class and don't have the, let's say, the advantage that you have, is I find it is, it's a bit strange. And it's like people, for example, all around the world right now, when they talk about the supporters of Donald Trump. In Israel, I hear it all the time. So the only thing they have to say is a bunch of racist, crazy people that hate everyone. But actually, when you listen to what part of these people say, they say 25, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, my father used to work for GM, earned a lot of enough money to support the family. Now I'm working, and my wife is working, and we cannot support each other because of the trade uh, agreements that the, the, the United States did. And I think that this is something that we need to be aware of if we wanted to understand how to talk to people from different backgrounds and different opinions. So I would like to say something about the questions part, which is how much we cope. Have you ever asked this question, how much refugees, Lebanese, can cope for half a century? They have only two million population and three million, even perhaps more, refugees in Lebanon. Not recently, last half a century. We had no sensitivity on it. What about today's crisis? Again, Jordan and Turkey. Okay, Turkey is a big country, although they have three million Syrian refugees, only Syrian. Jordan also, something one and a half million or something Syrian refugees. You know, I mean, that's why I said that we have to be more sensitive about other countries as well. We can't just say that they are away from us, so the problem, nothing to do with us. Uh, this is the core part of this. And the culture part, I don't think that we talk about um, religion, we talk about lang language or uh, some other things. We basically talk about religion. Because some politicians also say that, uh, you know, this religion is uh, uh, not a part of the country or this kind of things. Which, as if it is, this existing uh, ISIS kind of uh, Islam part of Syria. It's not part of Syria either. Als Nirbaram gerade ein so when Nir Bahram actually made a plea for listening closely, for talking more with other people, then I recall an experience, a recent experience um, based on um, his latest uh, reportage. Because he actually um, went to um, sister um, to, to the West Bank actually and actually talked with the people and of course we realized many people would have said oh but you know that's superfluous you don't need to do that because we do know what people are thinking you know but Nibaram, uh, you already stated with this uh, specific topic what is it actually that you found and uh, can we actually draw generalized conclusions from your findings Well, I, I, I felt personally, as someone who's been involved in Israeli politics for 20 years, that I had this concept about the solution, which is the European concept also that you hear in all this uh, uh, boring and in, unimportant con conventions in, uh, for peace treaties in uh, Geneva or Berlin or King David for the two-state solution, and that the problem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the 67 war. And that the 48 war, which caused the deportation of an escape of 700,000 Palestinians, and what they call the Nakba, is um, something that you cannot solve, and it's, it will interrupt 
all these great ideas to solve the problems through the 67 uh, war and to create two-state solution. So then I left and, and talked to Palestinians, I think from all layers of society, bourgeois, businessmen, working class, lower class, Hamas, PLO, and different people. And so you understand from the first meeting until the last that the most important Palestinian trauma is the Nakba in 48. And that the Palestinian do not see, or most of them do not see, the solution is based for the 67 war because they were deprived of their homes and lands and money and goods, etc., etc., in 48. And part of the reason that uh, I think now that the peace process will failed all the time is that the European concept and the American concept and the Israeli concept and some Palestinian concept from the Palestinian Authority is that we can solve it uh, through the 67 uh, war. So for me, it was very important experience because I understood that the refugee, refugees of the 48 war that live in Lebanon and Jordan and Ramallah and other places, also I met them in Chile, etc., etc. This is part of the conflict that you cannot shove under the bed. It's, it's, it will not happen. And, and so when I came back and told what I felt and what I discovered and what I listened to, to many of my Israeli friends in the peace movements, so they said, it, they said that uh, it's not helpful. It's not constructive. It's not, uh, it's not something you can work, work with. Maybe it's true, but this is what I heard. And I think that part of the, of the peace process, the, the European peace process, the American peace process, was not really listen to what Palestinians are talking about. They are not just talking about the Palestinian state. They are talking also about doing justice with the Nagba of 48, which this is, I believe, and I, I feel it's the biggest trauma. So at least for me, it was an important experience. A very important experience by listening to understand what these people really want to, to sum this up. The day before yesterday, Pope Francis received the Charlemagne Prize for his attempts for Europe and he claimed in his speech a new humanitarian, um, a new European humanitarian which is, should be based on the ability to integrate, the ability to dialogue, which dialogue can achieve is something which we've just heard. And we also heard again and again talked about the other side, the new right-wing extremists. Do we really listen well to them? Do we really understand what they want? What's the situation in Sweden? Are there convincing forms of dialogue? Whom sh who should talk to whom? Yeah, I mean, I guess this is uh, one of the dilemmas uh, for many years now. Um, how much do you approach uh, their way of framing uh, issues or how much do you confront it? And I guess it's been uh, a, a, a bit of an ambivalent uh, s approach to that whole thing, ambivalent strategy. But I mean, I, I, I do think that uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, one of the biggest, one of the main, main things we do is to listen. Uh, that's sort of the basis for, for, for being a writer. Uh, but I do think, I mean, with uh, taking what you said into consideration about uh, Trump, about uh, these other kind of very strong nationalistic um, right-wing misogynist uh, um, movement, I do think that in approaching it or in uh, trying to understand why people are attracted to it, I think we cannot lose uh, the ideology of it. Fascism ideologies are attractive to some people. And it's a truth. And I, I don't understand how we can sit in the middle of Europe and pretend like this is not a fact. Fascism is not a consequence of being poor. Misogyny is not a consequence of being poor. Of, of resentment. I think that these 
ideologies, whatever may, we may call them, they have a strong, strong um, attraction still. Uh, I think we are really in a new cycle that is extremely hard to analyze, to oversee, but I, 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 this is for me uh, a, a, a clear political uh, wave. And also the, the rise of uh, new anti-Semitism in Europe. I don't think that we can say this is because of uh, people feel disenfranchised, people feel alienated. Uh, History has not been like that. I don't know why our time would be like that. These are ideologies that uh, attract large number of people, and I think that the only way to address them is uh, through uh, uh, other political narratives. It is extremely difficult to have this dialogue because what is offered by right-wing populists is so comfortable because they do, we take away your fear and we, we take you seriously with your fears. And um, I would even say we don't need to take them seriously, uh, take the fears seriously, because what populists are doing seems to be, it's as a situation, a little child comes to in the room to his parents because um, woke up because of a nightmare and says, there is a monster under my bed. And what do populists do say? No, probably there are even two monsters come into our bed and tomorrow we will kill the two monsters instead of taking the child, taking it out, they explain, no, you look under the bat and say, no, there isn't anything. Um, but that is, well, m more difficult to do. And if I am saying you don't need to take the, the fears um, seriously, the, the concrete things they fear about um, it should be taken seriously. But that this diffuse fear, this angst, um, should be translated into concrete fear to really have a political dialogue, a political process. And that is a very ambitious program. And when we, we of course, we're constantly running behind these um, right wing populists, that seems to be one of the main problems. This morning we heard that people have a right to be afraid. And with this, I would like to open the discussion to the audience, questions, comments. And I see one, two people who would like to have the mic. Thank you for these interesting contributions. My name is Burger Selin. I'm a member of the newly founded association We in Europe, which wants to promote an exchange in culture and art. Two things. To take up what Tillman Spengler said, the terms integration of a staying perspective, as long as we do not have a proper definition of integration, what it actually is, it's not better than what we wanted to do with the guest workers in the past to at least the second generation of guest workers to, to force them or to make them adapt, which is not better than, than integration. And this staying perspective, a concrete case, among other things, we are um, helping Afghan refugees. They are more discriminated against than others in Germany. And also the responsible minister said this. They are urged to return home, to leave Germany. And now they received, our refugees received a letter, uh, two, 20 of them, and um, 10 complained by the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees, in which they were told, because there's no perspective for you to stay, so you cannot, you're not allowed to participate in the integration courses, which means that a perspective to stay in Germany is, ha, is used as a synonym for asylum, which they are not granted. And there is no individual analysis of their case, which would um, be as part of the right to be granted asylum. So um, generally, all Afghans are urged to return home. 
And the second thing is the European culture and um, diversity. Light culture, this um, concept should be defined. Isn't it also a very diffuse term which opens the door to right-wing extremism to find apparently simple answers? And we shouldn't forget that Europe is defined by a variety of cultures. So a general recognition of variety and diversity should be propagated much more than before. Also within Europe, there are plenty of different cultures. And that is why I would expect of writers to find to give us some answers to these questions. To recognize diversity versus to be afraid of the monster under the bat. The fear that variety and diversity would be a threat. Isn't that a dilemma? Can you align both? Well, I, I think yes. If you really demand something from people that this, this fear of um, diversity and it's diffuse and there are suddenly alien people coming and what, 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 what would it mean in concrete terms? Well, then go there and ask, what does this mean or what are you really afraid of? What shall happen? And then you will hear certainly they will take away my job. I will lose money. And interestingly, um, the right wing doesn't have the, the response to this question, but it's traditionally the SPD. And it doesn't even go that far. And it's even worse in Austria, where the uh, social democracy doesn't even enter into this dialogue. And um, they, they try to get um, the voters by turning more towards the right. But my impression is that at least this, this dialogue and turn this diffuse fear into concrete fears it's something you can't demand from a, um, a citizen in a democracy. And it's also a matter of respect because it's the approach by, of the, the extremists is disenfranchising because you keep these the people artificially as children. Well, you should demand more, but that would be um, the, the job of traditional left. Well, the approach you described is of asking, of asking what are the fears by um, being confident that you have better answers. I think that we also need to be honest about the question of, of um, in the process of migration, who are the people that the immigrants uh, meet in the first time? Do they meet all these people in the cultural sphere? Who, held, who hold all this cultural position in the theater and the cinema and the literature field. These institutions are the last to change because of immigration. Uh, like that you see in many uh, festivals of literature, you talk about the editors in publishing house about immigration. Of course, they all want uh, books about immigration. All of them are white. So the, the immigration, the first encounter between the immigrants is usually with working class. My grandmother, for example, she came from Syria. She talked only Arab. And, but the first competition she met in the lower class working uh, sphere was with Palestinian. And then she used to tell me, um, we need a more like a, a state for the Jewish. There is this problem with the Arab. So I told her, but you are Arab. So she said, so she said no, I, I, I'm not. But actually, she was. And I think that, that uh, I, I'm, I, I'm saying that this tension is a structural tension. For example, in every research in Israel, when you wanted to understand the racism between Jewish and Palestinian in the lower classes, you would see that part of the reason was competition in the workforce, something that people from the European Jewish elite didn't feel. Now, I'm saying it only as something that we should take under consideration when we talk about this subject. I don't believe there is abstract ideology that it's not about the economical condition. I think phenomenon 
like, for example, fascism in Italia. I think you could see many movements like this in the 19th century and in the 20th century. The reason for the success in a specific time in history is also about economical conditions. And this is why, you know, as someone who tried always to fight racism in Israel, and someone who believed that the Israeli society should be multiple ethnic society for all religious, I don't believe in a Jewish state. I believe in an Israeli state. But I think that you need to do it also to try to create a dialogue with all these groups and not just symbolize everybody as racist and not understanding and full of fears. We're all full of fears. It's not just them who are full of fears. People are full of, with fears anyway. You know what? Uh, I think there are some misunderstandings. We need to answer. We need to find a most influence, most effective answer against racism and discrimination and anti-immigrant, anti-refugee attitude in Europe. This is uh, the most important things. And for this reason, we need to understand why people are afraid. Only for this reason. Not because we are going to get angry with them or provocate their uh, fears, this and that. For me, I, I try to say that this is established Eurocentric idea, the problematic of Eurocentric ideas, ideology, you know, white Christian and all these patterns of history. We gave this education to our children for decades and decades. Okay, we have some critical, uh, you know, attitude as well. We criticize, for instance, uh, fascism, this and that, but the main base is uh, not the European we aim to reach, actually. We, we want really diverse Europe. We want really united Europe. And uh, let me to give you an example. I don't know, there are some Georgian friends here. I remember a few years ago, Sarkozy visited Georgia when Russia, they had a conflict with Russia, and said that, uh, uh, we don't want this kind of bloody conflict on the continent of Europe, you know. Where is Georgia? Eastern neighbor of Turkey. Then he returned, a week later, he gave an interview, said, Turkey is not European because it's Muslim, you know. So Eastern, so it's not even geography. I mean, we define Europe with some prejudiced, religious, or this or that, historical, racist, uh, you know, hidden or not hidden, uh, believes, actually. So, and now people use, we gave this fair to them. We didn't challenge uh, these politicians enough, perhaps. We didn't really want really diverse uh, Europe. I mean, I visited a couple of times Alexandria, and I have Alexandrian friends, Egypt, you know. We prize Alexandrian cosmopolitanism, this and that. And I have some exiled friend from Alexandria, and I was the expert being exiled. So she asked me, she wants to return back after 30 years, Greek friend, and I went together with her there. And first time she went to church in mosque together with me. She is very cosmopolitan, spoke five languages, but Alexandrian cosmopolitanism is cosmopolitanism between different uh, Christian sects and different uh, European languages, you know? So our European diversity looks like that. Alex, uh, kind of uh, improvement of Al uh, Alexandrian cosmopolitanism, which we need much more than this. We have another question, two more. Short comment to our guest from Israel. The topic of this panel is how much immigration can culture handle. So it really has a negative connotation, this question, to my mind. In Brandenburg, there is one village, or uh, I referring to Golzo. Maybe some people of you know the study that was conducted on there. And this was a village school that was threatened with closure because there were not enough 
people or children to go um, to see that school or to, to study in, in that school. Now, the mayor wanted to get more people involved, uh, so he invited people to come to that village. And mind you, school is really a very important pillar of our culture. And so the Galto mayor actually raised the question how much immigration uh, is necessary for us in order for our culture and schooling to be sustained. So I think, you know, maybe we should actually rephrase this question. How much blood transfusion do we need in order for a national culture not to become a uh, monoculture but stay diverse? Now, as to my question to our Israeli friend, well, you know, of course, um, the European history and the great suffering that emanated uh, also from our country. And uh, of course, the heading could have been that, well, Judaism does not form part of Europe. Okay, today the debate is Islam is not part of Europe or not a part of Germany. Now, from your backdrop for, as a citizen of your country, but also as a citizen of your people and as somebody who knows about history, I would like to ask you, how much Islam is tolerable to Europe? How much Islam is tolerable to Europe? Uh, obviously, you're involving me in uh, something that it's not exactly my uh, issue. And, I, and we have a lot of issues for our <laughs> anyway. But I think that, uh, that uh, you know, the, the, the way to portray the Islam in Europe is an essential answer to your question. If you, I think that if you talk about people who believe in the Islam religious, or people who, people who are Muslims, I, don't, I, I think that they are so different from one another, and they are so diverse, and try to create an imaginary group of Islam in Europe is a huge mistake. And I think that exactly the same problem is the problem in Israel, for example, that when you talk about the right of return, so you can say, all the Palestinians from outside of Israel will come to Israel. And you can look at them as one group. But Palestinians are so diverse between secular people and less secular people and religious people and very religious people, etc., etc., that only when you start to think about this question in a more diverse way, there is an answer. So this is why I think that it's impossible to answer to this question, because I think that Europe can actually gain a lot, and gain a lot, by the way, from many Muslims who came to Europe and helped to develop Europe in many countries. But the, the real question is, what do you mean when you talk about Muslim in Europe? This is what I didn't understand in your question. Because from the connotation of your question, you can understand many, many, many different ideas. But I think that uh, if you think about Muslims in Europe, I think in part, parts of Europe, there, is, there are great achievements of the way that they came to Europe and become part of different places. So this is why it's very hard to answer this question. I mean, how many uh, people outside of uh, Europe can Europe take in general from Asia and from other countries? I don't, have the, I don't have the answer. But I think that the first thing is to think about how can you really integrate people outside of Europe in Europe. And I think, for example, take the French scenario of the veil. So you can say, this is my culture, and it's a long and traditional culture. If you want to come to my country, you have to adopt my culture. If you don't adopt my culture, you're not part of the public sphere. But you can also say, my culture is a changing culture. I don't know exactly what is my culture, and it's in a becoming a phase when it's changing all the time. And this is why uh, immigration from Muslim countries, from other countries, could be very helpful to culture, very interesting. I think it's the, the question is, how do you prefer to look at it? And there was another comment from a gentleman in the very back. 
Nehmen Sie es mit. Genau. Hallo, mein Name ist Nijat. Nijat Yaziri ist mein Name. Ich bin Autor und Artistic Director of Maxim Gorky Theater. Two questions. First, from your various perspectives, from your own countries, um, what are the values that you attach to democracy as a societal form of order? Because I'm trying, I'm, I'm kind of losing my trust in democracy. Seemingly, and democracy is a principle uh, where there is a majority of the people that is taking decisions. People come together and they take a decision on a majority basis. But this is a principle. And can I actually task democracy as a principle with the task of protecting a minority? Then the second question, what about dialogue? What, what are the narratives that do exist uh, in order to promote democracy in your country? Then another question, are there any democratic mechanisms uh, that uh, actually can be put down in writing? So we heard about a project based on interviews, but um, isn't the situation such that I do stay at my desk and I'm writing something down, you know, as an individual, and so um, isn't that the way of writing that um, somehow alienates us from the rest? So literature per se, isn't that a type of democracy? Isn't that the question behind your question? Because literature is never a one-sided story. It's also always a story that comprises various aspects. So, all right, questions and answers. Just to uh, answer your first question, if I can answer. I am one of those who's a big junkie for democracy. Uh, I like it, I think it's great, and I think it's something more than uh, the 51%. Uh, it's the transparency of authorities, it's the uh, a free judicial system, it is a free press, uh, it is a, a notion or at least some kind of uh, ambition to um, um, for equal gender policy. So uh, I, I do think that I like it as like all the other forms that we have tried. So it would be interesting to hear where, what place does this question come from? Uh, what is it that feels... Moment, stop, 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 stop. Stop, indem Sie... Sie müssen das nochmal das Mikrofon nutzen. Ähm, Danke. Der Ort, wo, der, wo diese Frage herkommt... Ist so where does this question come from? Well, it's a desperate perspective um, on the democracy that I do see in our surroundings. I, th I think there is a failure of democratic institutions. Dialogue is nice. Uh, we want a transparent society. That's good. But uh, de facto, I do see, see that it's not working. Institutions are not. I'm not quite sure. I don't, I'm not that pessimistic. I believe that uh, democracy is really is really something that we should be fighting for. Okay, in Switzerland we have direct democracy and I did have my very serious doubts about this off and on. Nevertheless, you know the type of democracy or direct uh, democracy that is being propagated is a type of vulgar uh, democracy, popular democracy. It's perverted to a certain extent. Nevertheless, and it's part of your question, I also have the following feeling. Um, I think we should actually save democracy. And in this regard, what is important is checks and balances. You have to support checks and balances. This is where it's at. And I believe that 
the dictatorship of majority. This is a problem that you might have insinuated. And OK, maybe we cannot uh, simply uh, eliminate it. But I believe that uh, we are um, on a good path to actually then come to grips with it. I would like to support my colleague Nepal because it's a very important and my impression is you dear colleagues on the panel haven't understood it properly. So I'll ask the same question, but from a different perspective. I think what Nezatin means is what we see a lot in Germany. And maybe it's the same in your countries. In Germany, there's a very strong discourse among colleagues, police officers, artists, journalists with migration background who try to make this question public discuss um, question public. We've learned that democracy is the highest good to bring together different groups with different interests and to have peace. And then we see that it is small with a little group of people and said, we don't want to have this group. We don't have Muslims. We don't want to have Jesuits. We don't want to have homosexuals. And then we start to rise up as democracy. It's only 3% or 4% and then 5%. And they can enter into parliament and say it's only 5% in this region. And then they get 20%. And of course, it might also be a question of perspective that if a person with a certain biography or with a certain position in a country there and then you ask yourself, how long will this go on? How long we will look at it? Then, then the polls tell us, don't get annoyed, because in every society you have 20% of people who want to eliminate democracy. And then suddenly such studies show it's 25%. And then studies show that the relationship of certain groups of the population to others group of the population. And then we hear of 75% of certain groups of people at the moment who don't want to have Muslims here in Germany. Say they're not able to live in a democracy. They can't do this or that. And that is why we're against refugees, because in their views, um, the um, primarily Muslims are coming. That's a question. It's quite interesting that first you didn't understand. It. Maybe it's a matter of perspective, and and maybe you could think about it again um, and find a good answer to the question. Post question related with Turkey as well. The recent situation in Turkey. Both questions. I guess not related only Germany, but related with Turkey as well. I mean, because uh, I don't think that democracy's definition is the majorities, elected majorities. Democracy always exists with the respect of others and existence of the others. If there are not any institution to protect the others, the others, I mean, ethnically, religiously, sexually, whatever, any kind. Uh, we can't call just the election system as democracy. But it is true that we need to question now uh, existing parliamentary democracy. I have also experienced, before I came here, I share something in social media that we don't need anymore any election in northern Cyprus, which is Turkish area, because we have a... <sighs> More settlers population, not immigrant, not refugees, but sending from Turkey to settle down in Cyprus and change the demographic opinion, more religious, more uh, related with Turkey. And if any referenda will happen, they are, uh, what they say is uh, the result of democratic result. I mean, original Turkish Cypriots have, will have no uh, political uh, uh, existence anymore because original Turkish Cypriots are around 100 uh, or 150,000 and the uh, settlers or some of them came uh, with immigration reason, whatever, but under the control of Turkish army, that region, 300,000 something. So. That's why we need to make a dif differentiation between Syrian refugees or different kind of settlers or immigrants or questioning the very institutions of democracy. Because if you play with democracy like Erdogan play in Turkey, so they elect and they can do whatever they want, uh, change the constitution, uh, change this, change that, and you can call everything democracy. So what is this parliament democracy? Will it be enough, our needs, today's Europe? We need to, I mean, 
I, I, I'm not suggesting to change democratic system. I'm suggesting to improve the democratic systems because it seems that it's not enough actually for our needs. And we also need to create a more united uh, Europe. I mean, it's pretext, it is very uh, problematic because we need to be more courageous for united Europe and for uh, united different background people. And uh, only Germany can play a positive role at the moment for this, I guess, because of its, uh, not only because economic or social power, but also uh, to face the problematic history. I don't think that French uh, officials uh, has similar attitude on their past, colonial past. So, this debate perhaps uh, goes somewhere. I don't know. Um, can I say something? Yeah. But we are, again, talking about the, the easy challenge to democracy coming from the totalitarian right wing. But let's talk about the other cha challenge for democracy coming from the global institutions and the global, uh, such as the IMF, the European Union, etc. In Greek, if I go to vote, there is a democracy for me? Is my vote important when it comes to define the, the economical terms of my family? In Latin America in the 80s, when people went to vote, in what they called the la lost decade in Latin America, did people in Bolivia and other countries vote and the vote was really important in, in defining the economical conditions? Well, the answer is no. For example, in the last decade in Latin America, the forces who defined the economical future of these country, countries were the IMF, the American government, the World Bank, etc. So when you talk about why should young people vote, this is a very important question. In some places around the world, there is no reason for them to vote because the vote is not really a matter. So I think that the challenge for democracy is not just coming from the right wing, which in the last decade, it's not, I would say, in West Europe, it's not a threatening challenge. It's also coming for the idea of globalization, which takes from the sovereign government the ability to really define and to structure the political and economical structure for one state. And I think that this is part of the lack of beliefs in democracy that comes from the young generation. They don't see that the vote will change anything in their, let's say, everyday life. And I'm not saying it's, of course, and also you have to remember, they don't live in this vision of dictatorship. They live all, always in democracy, so maybe they don't appreciate it too much. But I think that the global ch challenge for democracy is even more um, uh, sophisticated and interesting and also alarming than the, than the, than the right-wing um, totalitarian ideas. Vielen Dank. Und mit dieser Thank you. And with this important enlargement of the range of topics of discussion and even economic aspects, which we also heard during our discussion, I suggest that we now close this panel. Europe is a very complex process. Um, for which you might find apparently simple answers, but a process which might cause fears on many sides. And it's beneficial to have a dialogue, to ask questions, to get more insight. And to quote Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who said this morning, you always have to go to those who are difficult, demanding counterparts. We will continue with our discussion at 3 p.m. with the next panel, and there will be a lunch break before that. And those who are not participants may also get some lunch um, in, on the fourth floor. And with this, I would like to thank the panelists.